start this new year in the autumn. I feel positively 100 years old. I've just been given a talking to by Monsignor Bell this afternoon. My tutor yesterday, and the junior dean. And now I've got to face Mrs. Samgrass of all souls. That'll make the fourth in two days. Who's Mr. Samgrass of all souls? Oh, just someone of mummies. They all say that I made such a bad start last year that I've been noticed, and if I do not mend my ways, I shall have to be sent down. And Charles, what's happened to us since last term? I feel so old. I feel positively middle-aged, which is infinitely worse. Well, I'm glad we had this little talk. Your mother will be so pleased. Would you care for a glass of sherry? I think I shall indulge in one myself. Thank you. Did your mother tell you that I'm doing a little work for her? You know, it was she who felt so keenly that we should meet. She did tell you, didn't she? Um... Well, she may have done. I really can't remember. Well, I must go. She has entrusted me with the compilation of a memorial work on her brother Ned. I say work, but of course it gives me immense pleasure. And what a delight to work at Brideshead. Quite my favourite house in England. I'm glad you like it. I, um, have an essay to write. Uh... Yes, of course. Well, remember what I've said. I'm sure we shall enjoy our exploration together. And you'll know that any success in the fields of academe would bring great pleasure to your mother. Yes. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye, Sebastian. Mr. Samgrass and his little talks were to play an increasingly large part in our lives. Sebastian spoke less than the truth when he described him as someone of mummies. He was someone of almost everyone who possessed something to attract him. I'm supposed to mend my ways, Charles. How does one mend one's ways? Hmm? Join the League of Nations Union. Read ISIS every week. Drink coffee every morning at the Cadena Cafe. <laughs> that would be a start. You could uh, smoke a great pipe and play hockey and go for tea on Balls Hill. Yes, yes, and I could, I could go to lectures at Keeble. I could uh, buy one of those little bicycles with a tray of books on it. I could drink cocoa every evening and discuss sex seriously. Very serious. Anthony Blanche has gone down. He wrote me a letter. He was taken flat in Munich and started a relationship with a policeman. I shall miss him. Yes, I shall too. In a way. Anthony Blanche had taken something away with him when he went. He had locked a door and hung the key on his chain. All his friends, among whom he had always been a stranger, needed him now. Sebastian and I kept very much to our own company that time, each so much bound up in the other that we did not need to look elsewhere for friends. My cousin Jasper had told me it was normal to spend one second year shaking off the friends of one's first, and it happened as he had said. Most of my friends were those I had made through Sebastian, and together we shed them and made no others. I kept a tenuous connection with the history school, wrote my two essays a week and attended the occasional lecture. Thus, soberly dressed and happily employed, I became a fairly respectable member of my college. And that is how Lady Marchmain found us, when early in that Michaelmas term, she came for a week to Oxford. Oh, Mr. Ryder. A lady's been here asking for you, so she left this message. Thank you, Oakes. I am so pleased to have found you, Charles. I may call you Charles. Of course. I feel I know you so well from Sebastian. I've just had luncheon with him 
And Mr. Sandras. Do you know who I mean? You may have met. And he's a very clever history don at all souls. He's been taking a great interest in Sebastian. Yes, I have. I hope Sebastian will appreciate his interest. I was so sorry to have missed you when you were at Brideshead. Everyone loves your paintings in the garden room. Well, it is very kind of you to let me stay so long. I think it was Sebastian who was fortunate to have you with him all that time. Is it true, as Mr. Sandgrass tells me, that you are my son's only friend this time? Well, some people have gone down. I suppose... perhaps I am. We do spend a lot of time together. I'm glad of it. I'm sure I have reason to be grateful to you, Charles, too. Friendships like yours can be such a help. She accepted me as Sebastian's friend and sought to make me hers also. And in doing so, unwittingly struck at the roots of our friendship. That is the single reproach I have to set against her abundant kindness to me. One morning, a week or two later, Julia arrived in Oxford, driven by a large man whom she introduced as Mr. Mottram and addressed as Rex. They both joined a small lunch party in my rooms, one of the last of the old kind that I gave. How much was it? It's just a few guineas. So HR rate ended up having... He can't have been more than 30 at the time we met him. But Rex seemed very old to us in Oxford. He'd arrived from Canada after the war, had become a member of Parliament, a gambler, and a good fellow. Lucky with money. You must remember, Mr Ryder, he's a colonial, aren't you, darling? He's never been to any sort of university. Lucky chap. Well, it just means you start out life three years behind the other fellow. <laughs> and Rex has never stayed anywhere for three years, have you? <laughs> Mind you, I know quite a lot about the house from F.E. He's told me some very rich stories indeed. I remember one about two undergraduates oh, yeah. and a goose. Old story. Rex knows everyone. Any cigars, huh? Down, my cigarettes. Rex. Don't worry. I'll get them. Stay in the car. <laughs> Excuse me, gentlemen. <laughs> Julia treated him as she seemed to treat all the world. With mild disdain, but with an air of possession. <laughs> Look, I'm helping to organise a ghastly charity ball in London next month. You two absolutely must come. Rex is having a dinner party first. I don't see why we should. Oh, but you must. The trouble with Rex is he doesn't know anybody young. His friends are all leathery old sharks in the city and dreary MPs. <laughs> Come on, Charles! Sorry, it'll have to be thank you to my company. Oh, boy, you're not coming, are you? Yes, aren't I? Delighted, dear boy, delighted. Well, that's a surprise. I suppose I have to go in the back. I suppose you realise this is going to be one of the most stupefyingly boring balls of the season. Well, I haven't been to too many balls this season, so that's all right. Mottram will lay on a good jag. Oh, careful. Is what? Nearly lost the bubbly. I can't sit back. You're not going to drive like this all the way to London, are you? I should be sick. Sebastian and I were to spend the night at Marchmain House, so we went there to dress. And while we dressed, drank a bottle of champagne. <laughs> No! Oh God, Julia, you're not even changed. I know. I'm going to be horribly late. You better go on to Rex's without me. You're very tedious. heavenly of you to come. We're all going to be hideously bored. Mm. Well, don't be too long. Probably gonna have dinner somewhere else. 
Todd Dobbins. But how is she getting over that? She'll be all right. Oh, Rex, that absurd, Jared. Why must you have everything so big? It won't be too big for us. Go to Mar Mayfield's. Who's Mar Mayfield? You know Mar Mayfield? Everyone knows Mar Mayfield, the old hundredth. The best club in town. I've got a regular there, a sweet little thing named Effie. They'd be the devil to pay if she heard I'd been in London and hadn't been to see her. So come and meet Effie at Mar Mayfield's. All right, let's go see Effie at Mar Mayfield's. Now, we need another bottle of pop off the good Mottram. Cut the bloody ball and go straight to Mar Mayfield's. I'm so glad you didn't let him hold up dinner for me. It's his Canadian courtesy. <laughs> well, thank God you're here. At last, we can go. It's all very well, but you saw, you know, we're the Of course I do. 100 Tink Streets, just off Leicester Square. We're in train the car. I'll begin to look in on the wall. Oh, oh Charles, have you seen one bullet? You've seen them all. I want to dance. No, I want you to dance at what? Ma Mayfield. Right? Not any sort of dancing. You better not drive. I'll, I'll drive. Very well. No, the way like the back of my hand. Jump in. Ready? You members, you want to keep out of there, you'll be poisoned and given a dose. You members, um... The name is Mulcaster. Viscount Mulcaster. Now look here, my man. I'm an old friend of the proprietress. What? Right. Try inside. You'll be robbed. And poisoned and infected and robbed. You're not members here, are you, dearie? Oh, I say, really, the limit. I'm extremely well known here. You wouldn't know me by now. Yes, dearie. Ten Bobby. <laughs> Ridiculous. I had to pay to get in here before. Lucky dearie. You can pull up. Anyone who comes in after you is going to have to pay a quid. Now look, I insist. Let me speak to Mrs. Mayfield at once. You're speaking, dearie. I am Mrs. Mayfield. Well, Ma. I really. I, it's so dark in here. I didn't recognize you with your. Fine. Well, you know me, don't you? Boy, Mulcaster! That's all right, Ducky. Just give us a ten bomb. Each. Well, I think it's all right.
Jeffy. Effie, you know, one of the girls who's always here. Pretty dark one. Well, we've got lots of girls working here. Some dark, some fair, some you might call pretty. I haven't got time to notice. Dirty Bob. Say, it's a bit steep. I'm going to go and try and find Effie. Fellas, I found her. This is Effie. This is Effie. Lord Sebastian Flight. How'd you Charles do? Charles Ryder. Effie. Uh, Can you get me some toast? Yes. That's another six bomb. This is the first bath I've had all evening, you know. The only decent thing about this place is the breakfast. <laughs> Get a pair of pickish hanging about. I've seen you here before often, haven't I? I'm afraid not. Oh, then it must be you I've seen before. I should rather hope so. You haven't forgotten our little evening in September, have you? No, darling. Oh, you was the boy in the gardens who cut his toe, wasn't you? Now, don't tease, Effie. Oh, no. Oh, I know. You came with Bunty that night. We got raided and we all hid behind the dustbins. Effie loves pulling my leg. Yes, it was just cross with me for having stayed away for so long, aren't we? I know I've seen you somewhere before. Effie, stop teasing, please. I wasn't meaning to, honest. Do you want to dance? Not just at the moment. Thank God for that. My shoes are pinching something terrible tonight. For the lady, sir. Thank you very much. That's 30 volts. Thank you, sir. Cheers. Cheers. We're under attack. Oh, Lord. Death's head and the sickly child. Mm -hmm. Tell them to go away. Ladies. <clears throat> Dear ladies, would you care to dance with my friend and I? If you really want to. We'd mind doing. We thought it was fairies at first, didn't we? Yeah. When you came in, we both said that was too fairies. Didn't we, Ray? Well, that's what we said. Well, that's what you look like. That was because of our extreme youth. <laughs> and our extraordinary physical beauty. <laughs> I think you're very sweet, really. Well, I think you're very sweet, too. Hey, how about a little party? Just six of us over at my place. Sir. Boy, we're off to a party. No, just the six of us. This very charming young lady says that she's got somewhere to go. Oh, I must go and tell Mrs. Mayfield we're going out. Come on, Effie. It was still early, not long after midnight, when we regained the street. The commissioner tried to persuade us to take a taxi, but we piled into Hardcastle's car, and there lay our mistake. 
I'm sorry if I'm impeding the traffic, officer, but uh, the young lady insisted upon my stopping so that she could get out. Uh, she will take no denial. As you will have observed, she, uh, she was pressed for time, a matter of nerves. Here, let me talk to him. Be a sport, handsome. No one's seen anything but you. The boys don't mean no harm. I'll get him into a taxi and see him I'm all right. Now, look here, my good man. There's no need for you to notice anything. We've all been to Ma Mayfield's. I reckon Ma Mayfield pays you a pretty good retainer to keep your eyes shut. Well, you can keep them shut on us as well. And you won't be the loser by it. My God, you'll pay for this! Do you know who I am? I am the Viscount Mulcaster! My father is the ninth Earl! Your side partner! Open this door! I insist upon seeing a doctor! Send for my solicitor. Charles, are you there? Yes, I'm here. This is a hell of a business. I tell you the fellow to send for would be Rex Bottrom. He'd be in his element here. Well, you understand, sir. We had to do our duty. Of course, I... This is an outrage. I demand my legal rights. It was for their protection, sir. I'm sure you did the right thing, sir. And we decided to let the young ladies go, sir. A cigar? Oh. Thank you very much, sir. Sergeant, do you think we could keep this incident between ourselves? No, sir. I'm afraid it's too late for that. The report's already gone upstairs and we've taken the young ladies' names as witnesses. I see. Mottram, I intend to sue for wrongful arrest. Tell him. Be a good fellow, Mulcaster. Leave all the talking to me. Is there anything else, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Would you like to complete the formalities, to sign for the sureties? If you gentlemen would like to sign for your possession. Yes, sir, please. Thank you, Thank you, Sergeant. Thank you, Sergeant. Good man. All right, sir. Sir, just under there, sir, please. Better all be there. We had all slept that night at Rex's flat. In the morning, the display was impressive. He summoned a man from Trumpers to shave us while his valet collected our clothes from Marchmain House. Rex joined us after breakfast. Good morning, gentlemen. I trust you're Good feeling morning. a little better. This is Mr. Selwyn, who will be representing you. Lord Sebastian Flight. How do you do? Good morning. Mr. Charles Ryder. How do you do? How do you do? Lord Mulcaster. How do you do? Yep. Please sit down, Selwyn. Thank you. Sebastian's in a jam. He's liable for anything up to six months' imprisonment for being drunk in charge of a car. Now, unfortunately, he'll come up before Grigg. He takes a grim view of cases of this sort. Now, all that will happen this morning is that we shall ask to have Sebastian's case held over for a week to prepare his defense. But you two will plead guilty, say you're sorry, and pay a five-bob fine. I'll see what can be done about squaring things with the evening papers. Though the star could be difficult. Now, this is important. Remember to keep out all mention of the old hundredth. Now, luckily, the tarts were sober, so they've not been charged, but they've taken their names. Now, if we try and break down the police evidence, they'll be called and used as witnesses. We must avoid that at all costs, right, Mulcaster? Hmm. Good. We have to swallow the police story whole and appeal to the magistrate's better nature not to wreck a young man's career 
for the sake of a single boyish indiscretion. It'll work out all right. And we shall need a don to give evidence of good character. Julia tells me you have a tame one called Sam Grass. He'll do. Meanwhile, your story is simply that you came up from Oxford for a perfectly respectable dance, were not used to wine, had too much, and then lost the way driving home. Well, let's take care of this, and then we'll see about fixing things with your authorities up in Oxford. Everything happened at court as Rex had predicted. Thank you, at half past ten that morning, we stood outside Bow Street Magistrates Court. Can I give you a lift anyway, gentlemen? Malcaster and I had paid our fines and were free men. Sebastian was bound over to appear in a week's time. Five Bob is monstrous. They should have cleared us. They put themselves totally in the wrong when they refused to call my solicitor. Don't see why they should get away with it. Malcaster is all over now. Anyway, I'm off to the city. Uh, my great uncle's just snuffed it. Taxi! I suppose Mummy's got to hear about it. Damn, damn, damn. It's cold. Why don't we just go back to Oxford and wait for them to bother us? Why don't we telephone Julia? I think I'll go abroad. My dear Sebastian, look. All you're going to be is find a couple of quid and give them a stiff talking to. Yes, but it's all the bother. Mummy and Bridie and the family and the Dons. I think I'd rather go to prison. I mean, if I just slip away abroad, then they can't do anything about it, can they? Can they? Yes, they can. Well, that's what people do when they're being chased by the police. I know Mummy's going to make it seem as if she has to bear the whole brunt of the business. Look, why don't we call Julia, arrange to meet, and talk it over with her? Hmm? Well, you are a pair of pickles. Mm. Good morning, Julia. I must say, you look remarkably well on it. The only time I got tight, I was paralysed all the next day. I do think you might have taken me with you. The ball was positively lethal, and I've always longed to go to the old hundreds. No one will ever take me. Is it, Evan? You know about that, too. Rex telephoned me this morning and told me everything. What were your girlfriends like? Now, don't be prurient. <laughs> well, mine was like a skull. Mine was like a consumptive. Goodness. Does Mummy know? Not about your skulls and consumptives. She knows you were in the clink. I told her. She was divine about it, of course. It's not me being divine about everything that worries me the most. I can't think why you went and stayed with Mr. Maltram. You might have come and told me about it first. Well, it wasn't really very much chance, Mama. I'm sorry if, if... How am I going to explain this to the family? They'll be so surprised to find that they are more shocked about it than I am. Do you know my sister-in-law, Fanny Roscommon? She's always thought I brought my children up badly. Now I'm beginning to think she must be right. Mr. Samgrass. Do you think it's any use my speaking to the Chancellor? Well, Lady Marchmain, I've already spoken to Monsignor Bell and persuaded him to call on the She's being perfectly charming. I don't see what you're so worried about. I can't explain. Mr. Samgrass, how long have you known Lord Sebastian Flight? Since he first came up to Oxford. I am an old friend of the defendant's mother, Lady Marchmain. What impression have you formed of his character? I would describe him to you, sir, as a model student. My deep regret is that a brilliant university career may now be at stake. Is this type of incident in his character at all, would you say? I would say it was entirely out of character. To my certain knowledge, Lord Sebastian has always conducted his life at the house with the most studious application. The evidence is that the defendant came up to London to attend a charitable function organised by his sister. That is correct, sir. It was a highly respectable affair. I believe the explanation to be, Lord Sebastian, sir, is simply unused to wine. The law of England is the same for an Oxford undergraduate as it is for any young hooligan. 
Indeed, the better the home, the more outrageous the offence. It is purely by good chance that you do not bear the responsibility for a serious accident. But for Mr. Sam Grass's evidence, I would feel disposed to give you an exemplary prison sentence. However, I have accepted that you are unused to wine. There will be a fine of ten pounds. The usher will show you where to pay. for the rest of the term. But the most lasting penalty we suffered was our intimacy with Rex Mottram and Mr. Samgrass. But since Rex's life was in London in a world of politics and high finance, and Mr. Samgrass is nearer to our own at Oxford, it was from him we suffered more. For the rest of that term, he haunted us. Eleven minutes, fifteen seconds. A marked improvement. They want to treat us like criminals. We can behave like criminals. Good evening, Sebastian. Ah, child. I don't think we've been spotted. How delightful. Did I tell you I've been invited to Bridesaid for Christmas? Your mother wrote me the most charming letter. find me in solitary possession. How are you? Very well. I gather Sebastian's out hunting. Yes, we've had a lawn meet of the Marchmen hounds. A deliciously archaic spectacle. All our young friends are in pursuit of the fox. I've been spending a cosy afternoon by the fire. Sebastian you will not be surprised to hear, looked remarkably elegant in his pink coat. Would you like some tea? Mm. Your arrival emboldens me to ring for some. Is Lady Marchman in? Uh, no. She's driven off with her cousins to visit a neighbour. She'll be back in time for dinner. How can I prepare you for the party? Alas, it breaks up tomorrow. Lady Julia departs to celebrate the new year elsewhere and takes the beau monde with her. I shall miss the pretty creatures about the house, particularly one Celia. She is the sister of our old companion in adversity, Boy Mulcaster, and wonderfully unlike him. I find her most engaging. I shall miss her, for I do not go tomorrow. How long are you staying? Oh, well into the year. And you, Charles? I don't know. Tomorrow, I start in earnest on our hostess's book. Thank you. Which, 
believe me, is a treasure house of period gems. Ah, the intrepid hunter returns. Hello. When did you get here? About an hour ago. Had a good day. Where are the others, Sebastian? I got fed up, so I hacked back. I'm going up to change. Come up and talk to me, Charles, will you? Well, no doubt see you later, Mr. Samgrass. Went to chapel three times on Christmas Day. Mummy found some eunuchs to sing high mass. <laughs> oh, very peculiar. Yeah. Well, we had the village crier bawling at us from the minstrel's gallery. And cousin Jasper dragooned us into playing endless games of bridge. Will I know anybody who's here? No, I shouldn't think so. They're all people of mummies and Julia's. They'll all be there at tea. See what I mean? Absolute zoo. Charles, you've arrived. Hello. Hello, Cordelia. Did you have a good Christmas? Mmm, quiet. I'm going to ask Mummy if I can stay up especially late tonight in honour of your arrival. Oh, that'll be fun. Sebastian, what happened to you? Oh, I got bored. Well, you missed the best part again. We had the most tremendous gallop across Springfields, six jumps to Plattswood, and only just managed to stay on. Mm. Well, we all know how brave you are. Well, I'm braver than you, and I've only got Mr. Beelzebub. Quite a good day's sport, oh, I thought, really. Sebastian, good to see you. Hello. Hello. I think the hounds are trying to form up we drank thanks to you. They pressed very hard. Yeah. Probably why we made a kill. Ah, oh, Ryder, how are you? Hello, buddy. Very well, thanks. When did you get here? Oh, right. Sebastian. What happened to you after you left the home woods? I came back early. I looked all over the place for you. Ah, uh, Charles. Well, Our hostess has just returned. She was asking if you had arrived yet. You'll find her in her sitting room. Ah, thank you. I'm just going along to say hello to your mother. Why? You'll see her this evening? Well, you know. I'll see you later. I'm delighted Charles has joined the party. It all goes well, I feel, this reunion of ours in your mother's house. I look forward to our time together. Did you enjoy your Christmas? Yes. Yes, I did, thank you. I hope you've both managed to settle down after the incident. Back at Oxford, I mean. I gather your penance hasn't been too harsh. We were gated, but... I expect you realize with Mr. Samgrass to thank for that. I mean that the pair of you weren't more severely dealt with. He's worked extraordinarily hard, you know, on our behalf. He saw the proctor, the vice-chancellor. He got Monsignor Bell to call on the dean. Yes, I know. Well, that's all over now, isn't it? I must make a short visit to the chapel before dinner. I don't suppose I can persuade you to come. We must make a Catholic of you, Charles. Religion predominated in the house, not only in its practices, the daily mass and rosary morning and evening in the chapel, but in all its intercourse. Who's coming to chapel for the rosary? 
fancy going to lunch? Ah, uh, well, I think I'd better look after Charles. I must have my bath at once, Mummy. I'm filthy. I'll come. I can change later. May I come to the Lady March bed, if you don't mind? Of course not. Father. What did saying? Oh. She spent most of the time singing Sam Grassy's phrases and reminding me of our obligation to him. Mm -hmm. How he saw the Vice Chancellor. And the Proctor. Yes, I had all that too. I do wish Sam Grass would go. I'm so sick of being grateful to him. Yes. God, at least Julia's lot are going tomorrow. We remained at Brideshead, leading our own life. I had no mind then for anything except Sebastian, and I saw him already as being threatened, though I did not yet know how black was the threat. His constant despairing prayer was to be let alone, and since he counted among the intruders his own conscience and all claims of human affection, his days in Arcadia were numbered. He did not fail in love, but he lost the joy of it. For I was no longer part of his solitude. As my intimacy with the family grew, I became part of the world he sought to escape. I became one of the bonds which held him. That was the path for which his mother, in our little talks, was seeking to fit me. You have so many beautiful things. No, Charles, when I was a girl, we were comparatively poor. I'm still much richer than most of the world. And when I married, I became very rich. It used to worry me. I thought it wrong to have so many beautiful things when others have nothing. Now I realize it's possible for the rich to sin by coveting the privileges of the poor. Can you see that? Perhaps. The poor have always been the favorites of God and his saints. But I believe it's one of the special achievements of grace to sanctify the whole of life. 
riches included. Wealth in pagan Rome was necessarily something cruel. It's not anymore. But I thought it was supposed to be easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's very unexpected for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. But then the gospel is simply a catalogue of unexpected things. It's not to be expected that an ox and an ass should worship at the crib. Animals are always doing the oddest things in the lives of the saints. It's all part of the poetry, the... <laughs> the Alice in Wonderland side of religion. Ready! Oh! Ready! Pull! Hello? Where have you been all morning? With your mother. Oh, God. None of her little talks? Well, I can't help it if she thinks I'm ripe for conversion. Ready! Pull! You shouldn't encourage her. She can be very determined. And I can be very stubborn. You needn't worry about me. Ready! Pull! Oh, God, look at him. Charles, I don't think I can take another day of this. Why don't we go away somewhere? Where? Oh, I don't know. Paris, Buenos Aires, New York, Bayswater. I think I'll settle for Bayswater. I think our father will have us. I don't think he'd even notice us. After tea, then? After tea. Come on, Sammy! Ready! Ah, uh, Charles! I've just been telling Sebastian I've made the most interesting discovery. Really? Paul? Oh, sorry. That Hillary term at Oxford, we took up again the life that seemed to be shrinking in the cool air. The sadness that had been strong in Sebastian the term before gave place to a kind of sullenness, even towards me. He was sick at heart somewhere. I did not know how, and I grieved for him, unable to help. When he was happy now, it was usually because he was drunk. And when drunk, he developed an obsession for mocking Mr. Samgrass. All this, Mr. Samgrass took in good part, as though each outrage in some way strengthened his hold on Sebastian. It was during this term that I began to realize that Sebastian was a drunkard in quite a different sense to myself. Sebastian, it's me. I got drunk often, but through an excess of high spirits and the love of the moment and the wish to prolong and enhance it, Sebastian drank to escape. Nothing's the matter. As we together grew older and more serious, I drank less, he more. Then, a succession of disasters came upon him so swiftly and with such unexpected violence 
but it is hard to say when exactly I realized my friend was in deep trouble. But I knew it well enough in the Easter vacation of Brideshead. Charles, go away. There's a good 